everybody. Ooh. Um, as you are logging in tonight, I see there's still a few more people coming in from the waiting room. Um, as you're logging in tonight, your cameras and your microphones are off. So if you could keep them off, we'd appreciate it. Um, let's see, we got a few more joining and connecting. Just want to make sure I don't have to make any of you sit through my spiel twice. Okay. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, I am Carrie. I'm from the Anderson's Events team. Um, I just wanted, before we get started, I just want to take a quick moment to welcome you to our event with Tom Sharpling to celebrate the release of his new book, It Never Ends, a memoir with nice memories. Uh, thank you all for being here tonight. The Anderson family has been selling books independently in Chicagoland since 1875. So, you know, this isn't our first pandemic um, and we're going to get through it just like we've gotten through the last few, but uh, your your attendance tonight and your purchase of the book through us, your tagging us and the photos that you post about it, things like that, all of that really helps support our business. And we're just incredibly grateful to have you guys on our side during this very difficult time. A um, couple of things about tonight, as mentioned previously, your cameras and microphones are off for the duration of the event because uh, it cuts down on distraction and of course the dreaded Zoom lag. So please keep them off. If you would like to ask questions though, we will have a QA and a session at the end. So go ahead and just submit your questions at any time through the chat. And then I will pop on at the end and I will ask questions on your behalf. Um, the more questions you guys ask, the more interactive and fun the event is for everybody. So don't be shy. For some reason, it's virtual format. People tend to be a little shyer with questions, but go ahead and put them in at any time and I will be collecting them to come on together at the end. Uh, if you ordered a book for tonight with your ticket, uh, please know that you will receive an email when your books are either ready for you to pick up at our store in Naperville or if you chose to have it shipped. Um, and just a quick note about that, we have actual human beings processing those orders. So sometimes that takes us a day or two. So be on the lookout, especially for an event like tonight, which has a little bit of a higher attendance. Um, if you've not ordered your book for tonight or you would like another signed copy, uh, I'll be putting info on how you can order in the chat with a link that you can go over to our site and order. Um, I just wanna remind everybody that signed books make a really great gift, very personal and um, just an all around good thing to give. So keep that, tuck that in your back pocket. Um, okay, on to the good stuff. Uh, first of all, thank you everybody for hanging tight. I know we got a little bit of a late start, so I appreciate your patience. So with no further ado, we're going to jump in here. I'm going to go ahead and just introduce Tom Sharpling, who is of course a comedian, television writer, producer, music video director, and radio host. For 18 years, he has hosted the weekly radio call and comedy program, The Best Show with Tom Sharpling. He's also known as the voice of Greg Universe on the hit Cartoon Network animated series, Steven Universe. Previously, he was a writer, executive producer for the Emmy Award winning show, Monk. Um, and he is in conversation tonight with John Hodgman, who has asked me to introduce him as a friend of Tom Sharpling. So I, with no further ado, I will turn off my camera and let you guys go. If you need anything, let me know. Thank you. Oh my goodness, look at that. <laughs> that was a great conversation. Oh boy, I'm afraid we left it all on the table. Uh, yeah. Our incredible, lively conversation is now over. Now it's just the drudgery of an interview with a hi, Tom. Hi, John. How are you? I'm doing OK. I um, I found my um, best show sweatshirt. Oh, look at that. Oh, yeah. my goodness. Which That's um, which I still wear quite a bit. Oh, awesome. Particularly in the autumn time, mm -hmm. like if I'm walking through the, the park on part of my um, self-improvement slash immortality project. Try to get sure. a little some steps in. I wear yeah. this. How's that working I, for you? How's the immortality working for you? So far, so good. I guess we'll see. And then <laughs> and then I was gonna try to share share my screen, but I'm not allowed to do it. So hang on, I have to I have to view myself, unfortunately. I can give you that access if you want. This is Carrie, the phantom voice coming in. Did you want Hi. access? Uh, yeah, screen? Phantom Voice. Let's see. Let's see how badly I can mess this up. Okay. I'm just going to make you a co-host real quick. Yes. Okay. And then you should see it at the bottom. Yeah. Okay. I'm glad. I'm glad to have this power, but it's just going to work better if I just, if I just uh, do it this way. Just hold it up. There's, there's me in the shirt. Mm -hmm. And then here, this is a better. Oh, you can't see it. Boy, oh boy. Tom, I'm sorry. I'm messing this all up. No, Go this back. is great. Let me go back. There I like go. that. This you know why my... I like this one? Why? Because it's a peek into my private life? No, because it looks like you have two little hats on your head behind oh, you. Oh, yeah. 
Looks like you got a little hat on that side, a little hat on that side. And a little top hat. And I was like, I'm going to switch hats. (laughs) This is the photo that I wanted to show. It's you and me way back when. Me wearing this sweatshirt. I'm very disappointed because I I realized that my my friend of Tom, little sailor hat, is in the state of Maine, Mm -hmm. which is where I am not. So I only have a little photo of me in the old times. Yeah, when you have your sailor hat, or you wear that sailor hat regularly? All the time, whenever I'm sailing my many boats. Okay. Sometimes if I'm sailing two boats and I'm stra- I'm, I'm straddling the two, mm-hmm. I'll put that hat on. I look very jaunty. And then I also found this old uh, pin that came in something. It's a Chiku pin. Yes, a classic right. Chiku AP mic cracking right. open a Coors Light. Right. Your, your nemesis, AP mic. Fred L. just entered the waiting room. I'm going to go ahead and admit Fred L. if you don't mind. Now that I'm a co-host, I have that power. Sorry about that, Carrie. Anderson, go for it. You don't know what you did. You don't know what you did, Anderson. I know, right? But so yeah, so I was going to put this on the sweatshirt, but then I'm mm-hmm. like, wait a minute, what am I doing? This isn't Mike's night. This is Tom's night. Thank you. Thank you. Right. John. So Thank this you. goes Finally. into the garbage. Oh, that's the. And finally, it's the night of Tom. Music oh. to my ears. Hey, Tom, shitty Johnny just entered the waiting room. I was should just going to say, shitty Johnny? Should, should we let that happen or? <laughs> let shitty say, Johnny sh- in. All right. Shitty Johnny, you're in. There he goes. Be careful, though. And hello to everybody, including Josh Cantor, who's in the room, an old friend of both of ours. Mm-hmm. Yes. My name is John Hodgman. I am a friend of Tom, uh, and uh, I've done some other things. But Tom is, a, I, you know... Um, very influential and good friend in my life. I'm really thrilled to be here to talk to him about his book, It Never Ends, a memoir with nice memories. Mm -hmm. Um, And Tom, you know, I've not seen you in person in quite a long time. We haven't spoken for a little bit. So basically this is a very nice catch up for the, for us. Um, How are you feeling now that your week, your book has been out for a week? Um, it's it's very exciting and it's also still so unnerving on some level because it's uh, me telling a lot of things from my life, stuff that I didn't necessarily think I'd be sharing. And now I it went from nobody knowing these things to potentially everybody. Everybody's one purchase away from knowing all the stuff I never thought I would tell anybody and it's in the world now it's not mine to hold on to anymore so that's liberating but also it is unnerving and it's something I'm still processing yeah I mean there are two big things about your life that I uh, having known you for years and years Mm -hmm. never ever knew Mm -hmm. and I, I gather that people who were I mean, probably you would say that I'm your best and closest friend. I've never oh, been comfortable yeah. with that personally, because mm-hmm. I have many friends that I feel closer to than you. I no, consider I you a very fond acquaintance. Please accept best friend ever status. Please, Tom, yeah. just take it. Yeah, I mean, um, look, I like you a lot, and I felt like, uh, and mm-hmm. I feel like we have something. Um, but I know that there are people who are closer to you than me. Who also didn't know the two mm-hmm. the the two big things right there are two big things that you were yeah there's two big things uh the oh. the first would be the uh oh no 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 tom don't give it away Ooh, okay make make them buy the book make them buy the book no thing come on one and thing two no that's no it's it's bad it's really uh it's it's a uh, I just figured this was the place and the the right place to tell these things because i could kind of control the telling of it and it just felt like it felt like if I was going to talk about parts of my life I wanted to get it as right as I could and if I was to just tell these things as stories on the best show or wherever it you I I would be running the risk of not getting them right and I just really felt like I wanted to pour over it and just make sure I said everything the way I needed to say it. And a book seemed like the best version of that, like the best, the best for a uh, place for that to, to live. Yeah. I mean, cause you, you certainly 
you go deep on the best show and you're and you're very vulnerable in a way that really changed my life if i can say because hearing you tell personal stories on the best show really unlocked a feeling in me that i could tell personal stories mm -hmm. um and not just make up dumb fake facts about zeppelins all the time and you know i've said this in 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 various venues and to you hang on arthur should we let arthur in yes or no tom yes yes to arthur yes on arthur all right stand next to shitty johnny arthur <laughs> Shitty John, look, Shitty Johnny has learned, if, there, if there's one thing Shitty Johnny has learned, it's how to command a Zoom room. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. You enter the you enter the Zoom with a handle like Shitty Johnny. Yeah. People are when, gonna talk about you. Yeah. All of a sudden this is, I thought this was your night, Tom. Now all no. of a sudden it's Shitty Johnny's night. It's Shitty Johnny. One thing Shitty Johnny hasn't learned is how to change that little name you put on from when Zoom started a year and a half ago. <laughs> and he was just like, I can't get it off there. Why can't right. I get I guess I have to change it every time I log in? You know what? I can I can also be shitty Johnny now that I realize it, because I did learn. I'm gonna capitalize there the O go. too. Yeah. <laughs> the real, the real shitty. The real shitty Johnny. <laughs> like, yeah. just the, original, like pizza. <laughs> the original famous shitty Johnny. Hey Tom, uh, you're in, you're you're across the country right now. Neither one of us is in Chicago. No. Uh, uh, where Anderson's books are and mm -hmm. um i'm glad that anderson keeps his books there it's a wonderful town toddling mm -hmm. i hear i'm in new york city it's not too hot but it's quite humid mm -hmm. my glasses are fogging up because i'm wearing this sweatshirt do you mind if i take it off would you take that please, and by all means please all right you may need to so what i was, and i got my ear pods in it's gonna be a real mess Tanya. if you have what a shirt saying, yeah if you have but, a shitty johnny shirt on underneath this thing i don't know what i'm gonna do holy moly what a setup that would have been. <laughs> be like, Everyone, this, um, is this is our first stripping author um, of the entire pandemic. I just wanted to put that out there. Like this, this will go down Ooh. in pandemic history. Thank you. Wow. Oh, that's better. Yeah, wow. yeah. I mean, so I have a podcast called Judge John Hodgman that would not have existed without the best show, without knowing you. Because even though the first time I was on the best show, and you very kindly mentioned in your book that I initially pegged the best show as the comedy of aggrievement mm -hmm. because I I came on and, and only knew the show a little bit before I came on. And you're like, okay. you know what it's about? And I'm like, I get it. It's the comedy of grievance, mm -hmm. complaining, you know, and there is that element to the Tom Sharpling of the best show. But what I learned very quickly and very deeply over the years that it's not a comedy of grievance, it's comedy of human connection. Um, and finding comedy in a pleasant way in other people. And your talking to the callers was always so fun because you never, I mean, except when you're making fun of people, you were never making fun of people. You, you addressed each call with a true curiosity and the pleasure that you took in discovering the interesting things that people brought to the table and the, the occasional harshness with, with which you doled out knowledge when people were doing dumb things, you know, like, and, 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 and making the mistake of comparing, oh, hang on a second, Tom. I was just, I'm sorry, I was talking to you, Tom, but Ken W has entered the room, should- By all means, like please okay, come on in. Thank again. you. Whew. Should never have become the host, you know what I mean? Never become the host, oh. Tom. You're responsible for everybody. You know that more than anybody yeah. else. You're responsible for everything on the hook. Yeah. And that, uh, you know, that truly left a really, really deep impression on me. And it, I, I think it's really shaped a lot of the way that I've tried to engage with the world since first meeting you and to address the world with curiosity tr and tr true engagement and, and listening to people, even when you're making a joke or whatever. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, that's very kind of you to say. And I mean, it's, it's one of those things that it the it's it's just like this back and forth though because if you say that things impacted you you've impacted me in so many ways like your book vacation land was definitely an influence on me writing this because you took something seemingly 
uh, that appeared to be one thing on the surface, but it had things running beneath it that yeah. were that were just very different than what it seemed like it was going to be uh, at first glance. Tom, that's very nice of you, but I have to stop you right there. Ken W, should I let him in? Oh, yes, let's let Ken W in. Okay, good, approved. Uh, anyway, mutual admiration of your literary agent has entered the room, Christopher Hermelin. Let's let Christopher in. Am I pronouncing mm -hmm. his last name correctly? I don't know, but I know he needs his first name pronounced like on The Sopranos. He demands to be Christopher. Christopher? <laughs> yeah. Christopher? Yeah. He insists on that. He says, say my last name any way you want, but my first name must be said in, in full Sopranos. Christopher. <laughs> Christopher Heim, Heimlich Maneuver. Yes. Is your literary agent. Mm -hmm. I, have, I, of course, was once a literary agent. And rule one of being a literary agent is don't upstage your author. So mm -hmm. you just messed that up, Christopher. Coming in here. <laughs> but I know Christopher too. He's a super nice guy. And he he was instrumental in getting this book going. Absolutely. Now he Christopher reached out to me years ago about if you ever I like it's saying you talk about doing a book on the show. You talk about doing a book on the show. Um, if when when if and when that becomes a real thing, please let's talk. And I never forgot that. And eventually, it made sense. And we would go. I would it would inch closer, inch closer, inch closer. And then finally, after years of that, it was it felt like it was time to do it. L Lolly's iPad. Do you think? This is, I think, an iPad trying to join the room. Come on in. All right. I promise, John, I'm still watching from afar. You know, <laughs> I oh, don't want to no, stress Carrie. you out with having to admit everybody. I promise. I just feel no, bad about stressing I'm you just out. Being, I'm being so, I apologize, okay. Carrie. I'm being No, silly. you, a, you can let in whoever you like. A, I just want to make sure joke. I wasn't stressing you out. Okay. Okay. No, I, am I stressing you out, Tom? No, no, I'm good. I'm cool customer. When, when um, did you, when did you write the book? Like what time of day? When would you get it in? You got so much going on. Um, it was an on and off process for for probably three years. Sometimes way more off than on. And I wrote three chapters to kind of show what the to try to show more or less what the range of the book could or would be. Um, the um it was um the three chapters i wrote were the billy joel story which i thought mm -hmm. was just like that's a funny that'll show like funny like just a straight up standalone funny story then writing about high school getting picked on and all that stuff was still funny but maybe with some some overtones of of uh horror or whatever you however you want to call it depending on whether you're a bully or not, that might be somebody's favorite chapter, actually. Um, and then the third one was talking more about uh, mental illness and the stuff that went on in high school around that time. And that was just straight up hardcore, serious stuff. And I tried to still find funny moments peppered through it, but I figured those three were very representative of what I wanted to try to um, accomplish with the book and that if somebody liked those three chapters then the book would be more of that and without revealing too much unless you would like to uh spoiler alert i mean the me mental mm -hmm. illness is one of the big topics that you had never discussed before mm -hmm. in in public i mean it really it, you know i knew that there were going to be some revelations in here i had no idea that you had gone through the experience you had gone through Mm -hmm. um, and I think uh, it was very powerful to read, especially since I can only imagine that it, and, and certainly you write about how it helped you, you know, reprocess some of that trauma. Yeah, and it, it really did. It, it, there was a real 
struggle to some of it because I knew it, it's, it's so strange because it, it was it was one of those experiences where there were simultaneously I was feeling different things about it where it was really hard to go back when my whole life had been about going forward to kind of get away from that stuff right and to, to kind of get as much distance from my past as possible so then to kind of do a 180 and go toward it was just so out of character for me to want to do that because I'd worked so hard to move past it um so that was hard but I also could feel that doing it even as I was doing it, I could feel I was gaining control over it by kind of facing it and not just letting it run wild. And because it's one of those things that just grows and grows. If if it if left unattended, these things just grow and grow and kind of turn into other feelings and impact so many parts of your life that you might not even know about that they're affecting because you're not taking care of business with your own uh mental health so feeling these things kind of get manageable to where i could at least face them and and acknowledge them and admit to them what was um a huge relief but it was still very hard while doing it because it was stuff i i could have kept just powering past it and not done any of this but i did and and going back and trying to re-engage with this uh, uh you know big event in your in your late teens mm -hmm. um was not actually easy because a lot of that time you had difficulty remembering yeah and the the whole system that you engaged with the whole mental health system you engaged with had forgotten you Absolutely. That was one of the parts, basically, in my quest to learn about, to get specifics, I realized how uh, there were no records and that the, the doctor who had treated me pretty much um, um, did not remember me, which was the ultimate irony and as that was, it was what it you talk about these power, these simultaneous things, like an experience happening, and you have multiple reactions that are very different at the same time. As that was have as after I got off the phone with the psychiatrist and went through this thing where he did not remember me, the the, the doctor who had administered all of this uh, electroconvulsive therapy and all this stuff who I'd seen for years, I went and just laid on the couch for just about for days. I was just shut, I shut down completely. But as that was happening, there was still a part of me that was just like, well, there's the end of the book. You got, you got the end of your book. And it was such a thing. I was so <laughs> mad at that part of myself yeah. for like still being like, can you stop looking for the the silver lining on this for like like it's like i'm allowed to just feel awful about this and i did but there was still this like chirping voice that was just like that's how you end a book i you mean didn't remember you oh my god you <laughs> they just like that guy did you a favor and then it's like no he didn't but yes he kind of did were, were you upset at yourself for thinking there's a good ending of the book just because it felt crass and shallow or because i mean another thing that i sort of discovered about you while reading the book was this sort of forced optimism this forced finding of silver linings all the time mm -hmm. because you wanted everything to be okay for everybody all the time mm -hmm. um and and to run away from the thing that was so bad so was was your silver silver lining impulse there just a a, a a a shitty impulse of like a shitty Johnny impulse, like yeah, I got the end of the book, the hell, or was it, or were you afraid that you were seeing a silver lining in something that was just kind of hurtful to you? I think it was 
there are points that I, I feel a certain thing that I know is probably not a higher way to think that I should be grateful that for whatever reason, I have this thing that like reflexively, like if I'm down, it reflexively like picks me up off the mat to keep going that sometimes you just want to stay down once in a while. It's like, can I just stay down? Like I'm tired, I'm tired of getting back up immediately after something happens. It's like once in a while, I would like to give up and just revel in that and let that run its course rather than reflexively being like, nope, let's, let's fix it. Let's fix it. What's, what else is there that can, that you can do to get out of this state when there's a part of my brain that wants to stay in that state and at least just wallow in whatever thing. It's just like, but I'm happy. Oh, look, ultimately I am so grateful that I have that in me because I'd rather have that than, than have the other version where I, no matter how hard I try, I can't pull myself out of these states. Um, so it's a, it's a constant struggle. And yeah, part of it felt like one of the things I went through with this book was the process. At its worst, it felt like I did not want to turn my life's experiences, the worst part of my life into cheap entertainment. Like I did not want right. it to be just like, oh, the worst thing that happened to me is now just a, a bit for somebody else to laugh at, not with. Like that was, the, those were the fears I carried. And it was, they flared up at night when I would write. Um, yeah. But on the whole, I knew I was writing something that wasn't going to be where I wasn't selling myself out, but it was a fear and something that I wanted to keep an eye on to make sure I didn't, um, I just didn't cheapen my own life. Because at the end of this, it would have been, it w I would have been stuck with that for the rest of my life that you did this to yourself. So if I'm going to do this, I need to do it with respect to myself and kind of override certain comedic tendencies to just be like anything is, if it can get a laugh, you do it. It's, right. it's comedic fodder, but there you have to have some sense of responsibility to your, to to yourself to myself in that process and I, and I did but it was just a I needed to like reaffirm it every once in a while to be just like no I'm I'm being I'm doing right by myself with this yeah uh, I I don't I don't want to make you nervous now Tom but as you know I am I have been made a host of this meeting and a celebrity has just joined the room Who's that? iPhone. iPhone has requested to join the room. Well, that's this, your rival. That actually sounds like they're coming to fight you. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> this is this is bad news for you, not for me. I just got a flag just says iPhone has requested to join the room and I let in iPhone. Let the iPhone so, in. Let the iPhone in. That's a good that's a scary movie. It's a very scary. <laughs> <laughs> we were both racing to that. <laughs> Well, no, I still feel like I stole it from you, or you set it no. up for me. No, that was a foot yeah. race. You broke yeah. the tape. Oof. You... Oof. I can't even thinking about a foot race these days kind of makes me out of breath. Can't, can't no. hack it anymore. Can't hack physical movement. Anymore. Saw me trying... Wait, do I know a version of you where you were running foot? There race? was a brief. There was a brief time in 2015 when I could run. <laughs> well, <sighs> could I run, Tom? I could run yeah. for like 10, 20 minutes at a time, like straight, straight on running. Okay. They called that was before, that was when they called me Runny John. Yes. Now they call me Shitty Johnny. I don't want to know how you got there though. <laughs> to Runny <laughs> Johnny? Because if Runny Johnny came from you running so much, let's we can fill in our fill in the blanks on how you got to be Look, Shitty Johnny. I'm not here to explain my nicknames. They just they just happened to me. Yeah. That's I'll say, those are the best ones. One of the things that. And is, you know, hearing about you sort of thinking twice about what you want to reveal and whether it's going to be laughed at, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, as a comedy person, ideally you're, you're trying, you're trying to find laughs, right? 
you don't know you don't want to be like let me put it this way there's a moment i believe you're on the boardwalk somewhere on the jersey shore mm -hmm. and you're wearing a king crimson t-shirt or something yeah uh, tell tell remind me because i'm going to mess it up remind me what the guy who comes up to you on the jersey shore says about king crimson and what that oh. meant to you i was at the uh, soft ice cream stand, as you can usually find me on the boardwalk. It, like, odds are, if you go to any soft ice cream stand, it's a coin flip whether I'll be at any one on the planet. Um, but I was at one on the boardwalk, and this guy saw my King Crimson shirt, and he came up and he goes, uh, King Crimson. I'm like, yeah. He goes, we get it. And then he like points at the 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 drones just the one. he's like he's like they don't <laughs> and like and there was a point where i wondered if the book would be called we get it they don't um but that could be a that could be the next book sure the one where i just post uh my uh instagram captions yeah because and in the book you talk about how especially when you were starting the best show not everybody got it but you got it and that's all that mattered. And when mm -hmm. you're doing something, when you're starting a creative endeavor, it may be that not everybody gets it ever. But if you get it, that's that's how you can get through and make it and make it meaningful and enjoyable to you. That's all that matters. That's how you make a good thing as opposed to an okay thing. Absolutely. So I was really I was really moved by that story as I read mm -hmm. it in the book as a as a metaphor for having a sort of the inner self-confidence to know to know what you know to get what you get to stick by it be true to it and it doesn't matter if the other people don't get it but then as you retold the story now you just referred to everybody else in the boardwalk as drones he did and i was like he oh was. he said I drones drone i didn't see them that way i saw it just as like oh. he saw them as just zombies living without knowing I was going to say, so, suddenly I realized you're just a sociopath who sees other human beings as faceless mannequins. Oh, not me. Those were my people. No, I know. Right. But he, you know what it is with so much of that stuff is like, it's, it's, it being on the radio, especially taught me a couple things about, there were points where I would be saying stuff that I was so proud of that I know this is the, I'm saying the funniest stuff I ever said in my life into a microphone. But because I'm on the radio, there is zero right. feedback. I'm right. saying it, I just have to trust that if I find this funny and that if my small pocket of friends find it funny, I, just, I would just trust that somebody else was laughing at it. Like I just had to build in that level of, of, of just tr of just sh just sheer trust of the of this experience and this process that that's enough and that the odds are there's somebody like-minded out there laughing at it also because i would have guests come into the studio and they i've seen people who are some of the funniest people get so thrown by that silence. Like that first time they're yeah. doing a thing yeah. and when you get nothing back, you're like, because also the radio, one of the one of the things that the best show did to me was beat out of me my ability to laugh basically. I, I can now, I now am the person because I, I have such a distaste for morning zoo kind of over laughing on radio and podcast. It's just like hearing that made me be like, I don't want to yeah. do that. But now I'm at the point where I just go like in real life where I would be have total permission to laugh. I just go like, that's very funny. <laughs> and it hurts that I don't just like lose it. Like other people lose it. Like I see that as such a gift that people who can just laugh and laugh and laugh because they're just in touch with the thing that I feel like I've kind of compromised by being on the radio for as long as I have. I, I, I did something to myself that now I'm just like, oh my God, that's funny. Like watching Tim Robinson's show and just being like, 
That's that's great. <laughs> that's very funny, Tom. Yeah. I appreciate you. Very. But I mean, I think that that's something. That's, you know, that's interesting. I never thought of it that way, but it's true that, like, look, I, I had a, I had a, when I did my own version, bad imitation of stand up, where I would go up and tell stories on stage. I had a weird kind of handicap because I didn't have a problem with people not laughing mm -hmm. because it's not always supposed to be my point of view. It's not always supposed to be funny. You know, like it's, mm -hmm. it's always supposed to have meaning and be purposeful, but because my experience like yours was one of working basically in total silence without, without the feet, without an audience direct feedback, it never occurred to me to try to design something that would always be eliciting a laugh at a certain pace or whatever. And yeah. consequently, you know, a lot of people would go online and say, it would have been nice if this show were funny. And I was like, yeah, I can't disagree with you there. Maybe there was some, some misadvertising there. Having seen you do things on stage multiple times, I never, I always thought you were outstanding at it because you were pacing out a well-rounded evening and not just, you weren't suddenly trying to be a stand-up comic. I'm not saying this I, to, I never to thought you were validation. ever trying to just match no. what stand-up comics do. No, no, I'm, I would never call myself a stand-up comic because that's a very real, hard and distinctive skill mm -hmm. that people work at for years and years and years and years. You don't just, but I do think that and I wasn't looking for validation, though I'll take it happily any day of the week. Mm -hmm. But I mainly want to, I'm just trying to articulate that the, the, it's a kind of superpower if you're a creative person, particularly in comedy, to be able to tolerate silence, mm -hmm. to be okay with it, to be centered in what you're doing on the radio and, and be entertaining yourself first and foremost, rather than anxiously filling up every silence with a kazoo or with a fart machine or whatever. Mm -hmm. I guess there's no such thing as a fart machine, right? I'm talking about a sound effects board. Let me just, I got to write down, get kazoos. <laughs> Make a note. It has note to self. Yeah, because there's, there's something so sweaty and anxious about filling silence. Oh my God. And there's and... something so incredible about tolerating silence. Yeah, and I mean, John Worcester and I did a show at uh, one of the festivals in Washington State, and we ate it as hard as you could eat it. And it just became this magical thing between the two of us where we were like, like, we're truly eating it right now. This is so much, this is the worst thing that's happened. And it's kind of special at the same time. Like we were, and I remember John, because John's been on stage so thousands of times he's he's such a pro at being on stage and he has so much more stage experience than I do but we were up there and I remember some guy yelled the thing out and then John just went oh I'm sorry is this not to your life like he just like started <laughs> mocking like I was just like oh my god that's he like became like a, a hero to me in that moment I was like you're just in control of this. And it just like that I'm not in control of, but the silence that comes from being on in a room talking into a microphone, it's like that, that I do feel like I'm in control of. And isn't it interesting that we both have been drawn to these certain things that do keep us, that the, that is not about our, us being upfront first and that that was not where you started or where I started but you grew into it though to where you you found a way to make that work I, I that it, it never spoke to me the way it has spoken to other people to want to be in front of a camera yeah I grew into it to the point where I really felt comfortable with it and then culture said we don't want you anymore go back to writing and I did and I felt better yeah I felt, well, better. I mean, I felt like it was a fun a fun adventure your book is full of fun adventures. You quote, uh, uh, what's his name? Roy Batty at the end of Blade Runner, huh. 
<laughs> I've seen things with these eyes you people would never believe. Uh -huh. And you've been in some very weird situations mm -hmm. be being compared to Judd Apatow in, in oh. Adam Sandler's office. In front of Adam Sandler. Yeah. One of the moments, as that was happening, I still was just like, and still I could just feel like <clears throat> this kind of, somebody had described it as observant ego that you watch yourself in these moments as they're happening to you, you are watching them happen to you simultaneously. Right. And that was one of those moments where I'm just like, this is pretty amazing right now. And it's like, it's like, look at, look at, look at that jerk off right now. Adam Sandler staring at him as this other guy keeps saying over and over, you look like Judd Apatow. But it's like, wait, no, I am that jerk off. What am I doing? <laughs> Um, but um, but it's like no, you're not. You're watching him. It's like no, but I am him. It just was one of those. Oh, those are the ones that you just know you're in the moment, and it's like, okay, this is a special moment. And uh, uh, I love the story of you having was it lunch with the Rock? It was dinner with the Rock. It was me and Joe Ventura, and the Rock. Joe Ventura, who I've uh, written with over the years, uh, uh, our, our friend, and he, um, he, we had a movie thing that we were courted to do a rewrite on and, and tailor it for The Rock. And it was just, it would have been like The Rocks, um, like every time these muscle guys have like the one where they're just like, oh, it's me and a little kid and I don't know what to do. Like, like, like it's like, <laughs> It would have been like that movie for The Rock. Like, right. they always have the one where it's like John Cena now. It's like, these three kids are driving me nuts. I'm a tough guy, and now I'm stuck. These kids are getting the better of me. It's like, so it would have been that for The Rock. And we ate dinner with him, and he was the, the coolest guy. You realize it's like, of course this guy is as successful as he is. He's one of those truly magnetic personalities and and then like Warren Beatty came over to the table in total like beta mode. He's like, I just want to say I'm a huge admirer of yours. And which is like, this is a guy I grew up with thinking he was like the most alpha of alpha males, Warren right. Beatty. Right. He's the guy who like you're so vain is about. And he I just I was just reading about this. He literally thought you're so vain was about him. That he, that's Simon, so vain. Yeah. Yeah. And Carly Simon was like, no, it's not about you. Mm -hmm. And he's like, I think it's about me. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I think the song is about me. <laughs> yeah. And, but he comes over to the table like, sir, it's a pleasure to meet you. And I, yeah. it's, yeah, that was, uh, no, I'm, well, I'm very appreciative of these weird moments that I've gotten to see and be a part of, even if they're not fun in the moment necessarily. They're fun after the fact. People, including Lolly's iPad, are asking some incredible, they're posting some incredible questions in the chat, okay. which are frankly a lot better than any of the questions I asked you. Wow. Okay. Um, so let me reset just a second because I, I can see Carrie. I don't know if anyone else can see yeah. Carrie. Can you all I see me? I think spoke. I pinned myself up here. She's pinned up there. So we and... have a lot of great questions for you guys, actually. Um, did you want me to go ahead and share them with you or would you want to go through them, John? It's up to you. Well, here we, uh, let me, let me go ahead and, and read at least a couple of them. Here's one okay. from Lolly's iPad. Speaking about, uh, so you said that this was a rock movie where the rock was going to be interacting with a kid or children. Yeah. It was like at a camp or something like uh, that. It was, there wasn't going to be a reboot of Bugsy Malone. No, it was not the a rock. Malone reboot. The Rock, the Rock would not be where he is right now if he had done it. Right now, The Rock would be probably opening a car wash somewhere. <laughs> you could have, you had, you had your shot to take down The Rock, and The Rock saw it coming. That was pretty much our chance, and it did go. not happen. Right as soon as, as, soon as he, rock. as soon as he finished charming you, he got on the phone to his agent and said, "Never, never let those guys near my career again. Yeah. It was too close." 
So speaking of kids, Lolly's iPad has a great, mm -hmm. great uh, uh, question. Tom, how did you become so good at interviewing kids on the best show? Always funny, comma, never at their expense. What's the secret oh, to talking just, to children? I just think kids are fascinating and so funny and they're just like waiting for a chance to be themselves. And anytime an adult gives them a, uh, attention that doesn't make them feel like kids, it's like oxygen for them. And they get to, they immediately fill it up and become, you, you get to see who they are immediately. And it's just like, I love anytime kids call, it's by far my favorite part of the show. Tom, hmm. was there, were there any, hang on, I, I lost this one. Oh, thanks for that nice comment. Laura asks, what was the most impactful feedback you received while writing the book? Did you share the book with a lot of people as you were writing it? I, I did, yes. I mean, Christopher was reading constant chapters. Uh, my friend Sammy Skolmoski was helping, who's a really funny uh, writer. Made up name. Yeah. Sorry? Made up name. Obviously. Yeah, no, it's made up name. She, um, <laughs> she was she was helping as through the entire process i would show chapters to her i would show chapters to christopher and just get that initial feedback before i showed anybody else from i showed the two of them and uh, but i really kind of pulled after those three chapters i showed those three chapters to a bunch of people and after that i kind of waited till the book was more or less done till I started showing more of it to people. I really wanted mm -hmm. to, I always feel like it's a bad thing for me to kind of give it away in dribs and drabs and you kind of lose the big impact of the, of the thing if you kind of whittle it away. And I wanted the, I, I wanted the book to also just to try to build a through line for it that might not have been, uh, might not have been um, more of like an emotional through line than a chronological through line. And I didn't, I wanted to, that to have some impact when I finally put the whole thing together, so. You didn't want to serialize it like Charles Dickens? No, I didn't want to just burn it. And then people go like, yeah, I read all of this except for two things. Like, I didn't want that feeling from people. It's like, wait, you want me to read this again? It's like, I right. read most of this. I wanted it to, be like, here's the book. James G says, or asks, are there any stories in the book you wanted to include, but ultimately didn't? That's a yes or no question. Yes, there are. Um, okay, I, now, I would... Tom, technically you've answered the question. You don't oh, yeah. have to go on. Move on, move on. Sorry, James G. I don't have, I'm not in control of this. No, I'm just giving you the option. No, no, I wanted to tell the story of how I could cheated secret santa um oh yeah to my when my family would do secret santa i figured out because i hated getting gifts and this is this is one of the lowest versions of myself i feel to be so consumed with myself that i can't receive a bad present from a from an aunt or uncle that i would we'd all pass a hat around or whatever and you'd write your name on a little piece of paper and you put it in, yeah. And then who you draw one name, and that's who you're buying a gift for that year. So that what I would do for years, I did this. I would just write my name on a piece of paper, throw it in, but hold it underneath my thumb. And then when it was my turn to reach in, I was just, I just would pull my own name back out, and then just buy myself something. And my mother, when she found out about that, she was so. <laughs> incredibly thrown and disappointed by it she just could not believe that that's how many how many years did you do this in a row seven seven easily seven years how come no one caught you at this i mean the statistic... everybody's opening presents it's crazy it's just like you just kind of it's low. I know it's a low point. I what know. would you get? What would you get yourself? I could buy myself an album or a couple books or something. Okay. And I'd be just like, Merry Christmas, Tom. Thank you, Tom. 
I think that's sweet. I think you should serialize that as a Christmas story. Sure. It me like and Charles David Dickens. Harris now. Yeah, right. It's just it's you. The it's the, the the whole the the whole humorous bracket has come down to just you versus David Sedaris. Yeah. Look out, Sedaris. Yeah. There's a new elf in town. Going to be a, a major throwdown at uh, next year's uh, National Book Awards. No, Frankfurt yeah. Book Conference is going to be Sedaris versus Sharpling. I like how you're mentioning you could have made up the Frankfurt Book Conference and I would just be like, I'd be like, I'll ask Christopher later, like, hey, any chance I get in on that Frankfurt Book Conference? <laughs> and he'll be like, there's no such there's thing. There's no such Frankfurt. thing as the Frankfurt Book Conference. Yes. No, Christopher will back me up. It'll I be like so. me and Goodfellas, like walking, like Joe Pesci walking into the room, and there's just, "Hey, welcome to the Frankfurt Book Conference." I walk in, there's just plastic on the floor, like, "Oh, <laughs> oh no." <laughs> no, I think that's mainly for publishers. I, I think probably you and Sedaris would go toe to toe at the, um, mm -hmm. at the Denver uh, uh, humorist off. Look, I don't want to mess with him. He's got these muscles from picking up highway trash now that he. <laughs> could take me out yeah. six different ways. I mean, you know, you cannot imagine the core strength on David Sedaris. He's bending over yeah. to grab trash off the side of the road 35, 55 times every time he goes out. That guy has got an incredible core. And he'll draw, he'll buy a shore house and drop it on me. <laughs> <laughs> that was good. I couldn't yeah. give you silence to that one. I had I had to laugh. I had to, I had to, mm -hmm. it is to laugh. Marcus mm -hmm. says to everyone in the chat, but I think specifically for you. Okay. Q, as a fellow New Jerseyan, I, Marcus, must ask, how much do you think our weird state influences your absolutely wonderful work and follow up? Oh, I don't like that. How weird does it feel to not be doing the show from Jers these days? Um, it's weird to not do the show from New Jersey. It is something, and <clears throat> ultimately the show, uh, the best show has been in a, such an ongoing thing. There's another chapter coming of for the show where this will be, we will make things more permanent. Right now, pande po pandemic slash post-pandemic slash pre-Delta pandemic, we are in um we're we're making the show happen despite limitations and um i do feel like there's a version where it's gonna be i'm able to do everything again and that's we'll we'll figure that out but it's so it's weird to not do it and the, as far as for the impact of new jersey it's every part of me uh it's gonna be a factor in just about anything i do because it's shaped my entire worldview. so yeah. Undeniable. New Jersey lives in your enlarged heart. Yes. Wait, your, did you hear something? My enlarged heart. Your your uh -huh. your your boardwalk fried ravioli yes. ingesting enlarged heart. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, um, Chris, speaking of which, Christopher points out this kid's the future, Tom. Mm -hmm. This kid's the future. Christopher is the future. It's not even a he's not even a kid. It's a grown man, but to me, he's a kid coming up, yeah. making a joke I should have made. Says the Frankfurt Conference, it's just Tom and David Sedaris eating hot dogs. All right, the hot Mark dog David. eating contest. Okay. Yeah, me, David Sedaris, and Joey Chestnut. Next Fourth of July, Frankfurt, Germany. <laughs> Frankfurt's in Germany. Frankfurt. Chestnut, Sharpling, Sedaris. Uh, Dip them in Tom water. Tom, Tom, Woody wants to know, were, were you at all apprehensive to go on WTF with Mark Marin the first time, considering how revealing a WTF interview can be? Marin is especially notable for delving into the early lives of his guests. This is a very, uh, what is this, a profile of Mark Marin that I'm reading? Considering how much you did not want to share about your early life up to now, was it scary as well as thrilling? I guess no, to hide it, things from Mark. It, it kind of wasn't because in my mind, there was a huge wall separating the things. I knew I would not crack and start opening up about certain things. I just knew I wasn't going to do that. It was not even a possibility because that's right. how 
it was so walled off. Yes, exactly. I just knew I'm going in and, and it's something I thought of beforehand. And I was like, it's not gonna, you're not gonna do it. I'm not gonna open up about things. I, I'm not gonna turn around and be like, oh, I can't believe I talked about all that stuff. That's just not my, that's just not my personality. It's like, right. if I'm not gonna do it, I'm not gonna do it. Yeah, and you had kept these experiences super secret mm -hmm. for years and years and years and years. Mark yeah. Maron's not gonna crack Tom. No. But Jim, but Jim asks a more pointed question. Tom, were you ever afraid someone like Nardwar would dig in and find out about your past? No, Nardwar couldn't. Nardwar would you know, go get me a uh, Big Dipper album and then try to make me get all emotional and be like, where'd you get that from? Um, no, I, I, that anybody like that, it was never, it just wasn't a possibility. It was like you said, I was, it was so walled off. It wasn't going to happen. Shitty Johnny, I'm, unless everyone's changed their name to Shitty Johnny now, this is the original famous mm -hmm. Shitty Johnny who came in the room. Yeah. Says, apologies if this is in the book. I haven't read it yet. Yeah, that's pretty shitty, Johnny. Just pretend. Pretend you read it. Tom, shitty, comma, you Johnny. know what, shitty, jo shitty Johnny? Look, I read the book, and not only that, I've had it read to me. That audio book, Tom, that's, that's the stuff. Yeah. I well, mean, I, enjoy, I enjoyed reading the prose. Mm -hmm. I Look, I have shitty Johnny. This is how unshitty I am. This is, I ran to the store. Runny Johnny ran to the store, reserved my copy of the local bookstore, bought it in print, downloaded it, also downloaded the audio book. I've read it in three different versions, and it's just oh, better every time, shitty Johnny. Unbelievable. Thank you, John. Well, I'm, I don't, I'm not saying this to you, Tom. I'm telling shitty Johnny, get out there and read the book. Don't. Don't just don't just buy it. Actually, read it. Buy it yeah. twice. Read it thrice. Yeah. Um, and also, Tom, it really is a great book. Congratulations. I really, really enjoyed and, it a lot. Tom, it's just, just. I appreciate that. It's beautiful. It's beautiful, and it's funny, and it's terrific. And anyway, Shitty Johnny had this question, Tom. If you had Jeff Bezos' money, what show would you resurrect? Enlightened. And as a follow-up, uh, follow-ups, have you tried s'mores flavored Oreos? I just tried s'mores flavored Oreos and I bought a package of them and then had a few and then walked the rest of them to the garbage can because I didn't want to keep eating them. I literally tossed them out because I was like, I will eat all of these because I wasn't particularly enjoying them, but I still would have eaten all of them. I was just like, these need to get out of my life. Um, they were fine, but um, what would I resurrect? Probably. Yeah, what TV show, if you had all the money and power in the world, a cance I guess it's a canceled TV show, what Probably show would you bring back? Either Studio 60 on Sunset Strip or sure. um, Battle of Network Stars. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> That'd be great. Um, I'm not, yeah, Battle of Network Stars would be really, that would be good. Not bored mm -hmm. to death, though? Got it. Understood. Josh no, no, Kendra no. says, Look, no, no, that's cool. I'll bring bored to death back, but I only want to focus on that one character on it. Oh, yeah. That's Would probably you been a lot of shave? stories. What's Are you willing that? to shave? No, unfortunately. Hi. Josh, <laughs> what's up, Carrie? Oh, no, I'm going to go ahead and let you, our, our time is coming to an end. We only have the Zoom account for another couple minutes, but I'll okay. go ahead and let you, I was going to say maybe one more question or if you wanted to read Josh's comment or. Yeah, well, I do want to give a, I'm going to read Josh's comment. Tom, I have, I have to run to a family thing. Oh, it's an excuse as much as it is a comment. <laughs> but thank you so much for doing this. Both of you, oh, have influenced me beyond measure. Carrie, did you know that? You and Tom have influenced Josh. I Also, it's been about at least 30 years since I laughed as hard as I did when I read Tom's description in the book of his idea for a Paul Simon music video. Oh. That, yeah. Yeah. That was incredible. There, that's what I would do with the Beza, uh, the Bezos money would be to make that video. How, like with a deep fake of Paul Simon, or you think if you no, rolled up Paul, enough I'd money, pay him enough that he would just be like, fine, be like all right, well, thirty-five million. He'd be like, okay, I guess for thirty-five million dollars, I'm going to get knocked over by an oil drum. <laughs> <laughs> it was really, really funny. 
Ryan wants you to reboot vinyl. Here, let's do a quick lightning round, see if there's anything I missed. Lolly's iPad, Secret Santa cracked me up. It's a great book, everybody. Everyone should buy it. Every book that, is, uh, that they buy tonight through Anderson's is signed, right, Carrie? Yes, it is. Fantastic. Right. If you haven't done it yet, purchase it from Anderson's. They've got an extremely, extremely compelling uh, auto signature mm -hmm. reminding you that buying from a, a major online retailer of books uh, puts people and communities out of work. So buy locally, go buy yes. from Anderson's. Well, I mean, they've had a real, they did really well during the pandemic. Let's, let's be honest. Amazon, Amazon's doing okay, but we, we I could mean, use a bone thrown our way if, you know, you wouldn't mind buying the book through us. So, yeah. Oh, of course, people should support uh, local bookstores. It's the lifeblood of, of books for me. Eric says, hi from New Jersey. Greetings from Bergen County. Uh, 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 Charles and Kristen Howell. Uh, sorry, I read your last name, suggest it sh the movie should be The Rock's Mr. Nanny. There are a lot of things you hint at in this book that we don't get to hear more about, like Flying V, the mm -hmm. screenplay that I very much want to read. Yeah. I want to know, you, you tease a lot that doesn't get revealed. Yeah, the book was basically a giant Argo type situation for me to try to sell on un unpurchased screenplays, to be honest. Yeah. I pitched if five I projects that did not go the distance. And I remind people over and over that they're currently available for purchase. <laughs> they are an executive. <laughs> so, um, no, I, um, yeah, I'll, like, we'll talk about fine. I'll send you fine. Hey, um, shitty Johnny, if you know, if you know anybody in the biz, uh, you should purchase Flying V and also Rock School. Rock and School. Also, and also, and also, yeah, there's some new rock out there on the horizon mm -hmm. who needs a muscle guy versus kids movie. Probably some, yeah, exactly. Um, all right. Well, unfortunately, guys, our time together is coming to a close today okay. here. Um, and I just wanted to say, you know, sorry to everyone whose questions we didn't get to. Um, and thanks so much for submitting them. I, you know, don't tell all the other audiences I said this, but your guys' questions were definitely the best. Um, and I wish we could have gotten through them all. So thanks. Um, a couple of things. I know there was a mix up when the link went out um, tonight. I know that it had they had two different times on them, I guess. So I'm, that's what I'm hearing from people. So I'm very, very sorry about that. Um, and I deeply apologize. The good thing is that Anderson's also had some technical difficulties before we started because we are just a mess tonight. And so we got started late. So those of you who came in late, you actually didn't miss that much. I am so sorry about that though. Um, a lot of you have asked me if this event was being recorded. It is, it will be edited and it'll be on our YouTube um, channel. And usually she sends out an email, my coworker, when she does that, I will make sure she does that actually this one quickly and, and gets that out to you guys. I'm very sorry about that, but thank you so much for sticking with us. Other than that, I just, of course, wanted to thank both of you for being here tonight, Tom and, and John. Thank you so much. I'm greatly um, appreciative of you guys for sticking through it and rolling with it. Um, and of course, again, because yeah. I don't say it enough times, thanks to everyone out there. <laughs> John, John, I want to thank you for doing this. This really means so much to me. Then I, you know, oh. you're some... I'm not going to, I love you and you've been so kind to me in so many different ways. And this is just one more way you've been kind to me. So I do appreciate it. Tom um, Sharpling, I love you too. I miss you. I'm, I, I'm sorry that um, Anderson's cheaped out on the Zoom account and we can't stick around yeah. for another couple of it's hours. It's actually true. It's completely yeah. valid and true. <laughs> I could have hosted, I could have hosted yeah. this. I've got a pro yeah. account. Michael P it's, is now just joining. It's been a tight year. It's been a tight year. We've had to uh, we've had to adjust just, things in places. But yeah, no, it's super valid. So I sorry. just want to say to Michael P, who just joined the room, welcome to the end of the show. <laughs> welcome to the end of the tour, right, Tom? This is the last yeah, virtual this event is for the last one. Yes. Is there a best show on the on the, yes. on the internet radio in tonight? Minutes. In fifteen minutes, there will be a best show. All right, I will be listening. Everybody, go check out. Go to Anderson's if you've not done so already. Mm -hmm. uh, Thank reserve you. Reserve and buy your copy of "It Never Ends: A Memoir yeah. with Nice Memories" by Tom Sharpling, and truly one of my heroes and one of the United States's and the world's heroes as well. Thank you so much, Anderson. Thank you, John, and I appreciate it. And I'll, I'll of see Thank everybody you on the best. So Thanks so much. Bye. Break a leg. Bye, everybody. Bye. Stay safe out there.